Hey everyone, what's up? It's good to see you. My name is Caleb. This is a channel called Theophile. Here we talk about books that talk about God and we talk about them kindly. I'm glad you're here. Okay, so I've been making some videos where I summarize and present the material in N.T. Wright's magnum opus, Christian Origins and the Question of God, or Coach Cog for short. In this video, we're going over the second volume in the project, the blue book, Jesus and the Victory of God, or Jatbog for short. In the previous video, I went over chapters one through four, or section one of the project, where Wright introduces us to historical Jesus studies. In this video, I'm gonna jump into chapter five, and we're just gonna keep going through the book. So at the beginning of chapter five, Wright reiterates a bit how he's going to go about reconstructing a picture of the historical Jesus. And he says there are two roads he does not want to travel down while reconstructing Jesus. The first road is the fideistic road. And Wright says fideists often fail to properly contextualize Jesus in late Second Temple Judaism, because they're hesitant about asking too many extra-biblical historical questions or using too many extra-biblical historical sources. By so privileging the canon, Wright says, Phidias often turn Jesus into a theological figure, abstracted from concrete history. Wright also says that Phidias are often hesitant to recognize how heavily Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have been theologically edited by their authors for the needs of the early church. They're often read as just contemporary journal reports. The second road Wright does not want to travel down while reconstructing a picture of the historical Jesus is the Reedian Road. And Wright points out that for many of the students of William Reed, the Gospels are heavily distrusted. They want to cut through the propaganda of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get to the true Jesus of history. And this true Jesus of history for many of those students is essentially non-Jewish. He's a Greek peripatetic philosopher, or he's a politician. And Wright says that these deconstructive projects often become viciously circular. Rather, we're going to follow the lead of Albert Schweitzer. Now, to be sure, Wright and Schweitzer disagree on many important issues. One of those will be brought up in a moment. But in general, Wright and Schweitzer approach the task of reconstructing the historical Jesus in a very similar way. First of all, there's a general trust in the historical reliability of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those sources, along with a handful of extra biblical sources, are used to create a narrative of the subject's life. Then you ask, how would that narrative have been understood by Jesus' contemporaries? You want to look at Jesus' ministry through the eyes of someone in the crowd, if you will. You want to understand Jesus' ministry using their categories, being careful not to retroject contemporary categories into the minds of people who were looking at Jesus. Then you move from the outside to the inside, and you ask, how did this subject understand himself? Who did he think he was? In Jesus' case, we want to ask, who did he think he was in relation to God? Who did he think God was? And what did he think his impending death would mean? Now, you might fill in the contours of Jesus' life a little differently than Wright or Schweitzer, but I think if we can agree that in general this is the best methodology by which we can reconstruct any historical figure, then we're over halfway there. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about Jesus or Shakespeare or Caesar or Abraham Lincoln. If we can all agree this is the best way to go about reconstructing any historical figure, then I think we've already done a lot of the work. So in the rest of chapter 5, it's a very long chapter, in the rest of chapter 5, Wright argues that the basic category in which Jesus' contemporaries would have understood him is that of a Jewish prophet. He was lining himself up with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and Jesus wanted to be seen in that long line of Jewish prophets. Now, his contemporaries may have thought he was a true prophet or a false prophet, but everyone would have seen by his actions and words that the basic category in which Jesus' ministry was to be understood was that of a Jewish prophet. Whatever else Jesus might be beyond a Jewish prophet, Wright argues is a conversation for a later date. And whatever else Jesus might be needs to be understood as basically an outgrowth of this primary category. Jesus' most basic identity is as a Jewish prophet. But then, in chapters 6, 7, and 8, Wright advances a further thesis. And I think this thesis is really the category-changing thesis for most readers of the book. Wright argues that Jesus, unlike the prophets who preceded him, was claiming to be inaugurating the kingdom of God. The prophets who preceded Jesus spoke about a coming day when God would reclaim his people and he would give them his spirit and forgive their sins and he would again be God over his reformed people. And Jesus is saying that that kingdom of God which the previous prophets promised is being inaugurated in my coming. That claim of Jesus I think is a category shift for most readers because it means that when Jesus was running around Israel, he wasn't basically saying, here's how you can get out of hell. He wasn't basically saying, here's ethical advice to help you live a more moral life. And he wasn't basically saying, here are some theological axioms that you need to affirm so you believe the correct things. Wright wants to argue that the essence of Jesus' ministry 
was as a Jewish prophet claiming to inaugurate the kingdom of God. Put in the most pointed way, that means Jesus would not have asked you, what will you say to God when you die, and he asks you, why should I let you into heaven? Rather, Jesus would ask you the question, which kingdom are you giving ultimate allegiance to? I'm inaugurating the kingdom of God, give me ultimate allegiance. And anything Jesus might say about personal destiny, or personal ethics, or personal theology, needs to be deflated and then situated within the primary context, which is that Jesus is a Jewish prophet claiming to inaugurate the kingdom of God. His message is basically political and secondarily soteriological. Wright then runs through a lot of the staples of Jesus's ministry and helps us rethink those staples in light of the fact that the ultimate context of his ministry is basically one of kingdom announcement. The first thing he looks at in Jesus' ministry is his call. Jesus would frequently say, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. And Wright wants to say that phrase, repent and believe, isn't basically about the call to have a sad religious experience followed by a belief in atonement so your sins can be forgiven. Wright wants to say the call to repent and believe is basically about stop giving your ultimate allegiance to a different kingdom, either a Jewish or a pagan kingdom, and now give all of your pistis, give all of your faithfulness or allegiance, give your belief to the kingdom that I'm inaugurating. Repentance and belief has to do with corporate cosmic kingdom allegiance, not individual forgiveness of sins. Wright then looks at the miracles of Jesus, and he says it's important we don't take these miracles out of their context and then use them as proofs for Jesus' divinity or use them as apologetic tools to prove we have the right religion or something. And again, those might be fine conversations to have at a different place, but while we're reconstructing the historical Jesus and we look at his mighty deeds, the question has to be, how would people in the audience, using their first century categories, have interpreted those mighty deeds? And Wright wants to argue that all of the mighty deeds of Jesus were calculated actions performed to calculated audiences. All of them were physical manifestations of the claim that the kingdom was being inaugurated. The prophets who preceded Jesus said things like, when the kingdom comes, the poor and the hungry will be fed, so Jesus multiplies the fish and the loaves. And the prophets who preceded Jesus said things like, when the kingdom comes, the poor and the outcast and the widow and the Gentile will be welcomed, so Jesus performs healing ministries on those people. And the prophets who preceded Jesus said things like, when the kingdom of God comes, evil spirits and dark forces will be pushed back, so Jesus performs exorcisms. It's important we understand these miracles in their immediate context, which is that they are physical demonstrations of the claim that the kingdom of God is being inaugurated. Whatever other theological points they might prove is secondary to this primary category of kingdom announcement. Wright then runs through a lot of the different staples of Jesus' ministry and helps us think through how those aspects of his ministry should be rethought in light of this corporate kingdom claim being the center of his ministry, but I'll look at just one more. Wright says that we need to look at Jesus' judgment sayings. When Jesus says, so-and-so will be thrown out where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is where Wright and Schweitzer heavily disagree. Schweitzer basically believed that Jesus was a false prophet. Jesus thought he would be coming in glory to establish a new earth within 50 years or so. And all of these judgment sayings were statements of impending judgment. And Wright wants to say that actually Schweitzer has misread these judgment sayings. Rather, we need to read the judgment sayings against the backdrop of Second Temple Jewish apocalyptic literature. And Jesus is rather saying, the Jewish kingdom, the Jewish authorities which are rejecting my kingdom claim, have become slaves of dark powers themselves. And one day soon, God is going to judge these specific Jewish authorities. So all of the judgment sayings for right end up being about 70 AD. Now, we can talk about whether Wright has gone too far by making all of the judgment sayings exclusively about 70 AD. Maybe some of the judgment sayings do have to do with personal eschatology, but I think Wright's point needs to be heard, that a lot of the times when Jesus is talking about how so-and-so will be judged, he really is addressing his contemporary context, which is that he is claiming to be inaugurating the kingdom of God, but that kingdom is being rejected by Jewish authorities, so Jesus is pronouncing a judgment on those authorities. Whatever other future judgments Jesus may be speaking about is again a future conversation after we understand this primary context 
context of Jesus claiming to inaugurate the kingdom of God. At the end of chapter 8, Wright reiterates his point one more time. Jesus' ministry was not about helping individuals get out of hell, it was not about helping individuals live more moral lives, and it was not about teaching individuals better theology. Jesus' ministry was basically about announcing the coming of a corporate, climactic, story-ending kingdom. And everything else he says needs to be resituated within that major context. I heard a funny analogy to this recently, and it's that no one thinks of Karl Marx as a fashion expert. But actually, this person pointed out to me that Marx had a lot to say about fashion and how people should dress and how people in the government should dress. But the point is, we don't all think of Karl Marx as a fashion designer. He was kind of famous for something else. Now, I don't mean to compare Jesus and Marx. I'm just saying that you can't take a smaller part of someone's career and then blow that up and use it as the main category in which the rest of their career is then defined. Marx isn't a fashion designer, and Jesus isn't basically about telling people how to go to heaven. That's a smaller thing he does within his larger kingdom context. He's the prophet announcing the kingdom of God. So then, in chapters 9 and 10, Wright asks the question, why did this kingdom announcement get so many people so upset that they all agreed the only thing we can do this to this guy is publicly execute? How did this kingdom announcement lead to Jesus' execution? I'm going to summarize those chapters along with the rest of the book in my next video. I hope this video was helpful for you, and I hope to see you again. Thanks for watching.